This is Jeffrey Gettleman reporting from Somalia. It's Friday, soccer day in Kismayo, and the beach is packed with kids playing pickup games by the shore. There's a sense of freedom, but a lingering sense of danger, too, as gunmen patrol the same stretch of sand that serves as the city's playground. For the past two weeks, I've been traveling across Somalia, a country that has not had a functioning government for 16 chaotic years. Just days before I got here, the transitional government, backed up by Ethiopian firepower, pushed out the Islamist forces who ruled so much of this country. The fighting is not totally over yet, and a clan-based insurgency seems to be growing. But the government is moving ahead with the enormous task of putting Somalia back together. Cities look like they were bombed by aircraft or rocked by large explosions. But the destruction here is of a different kind. It comes from gun battles, one after another. And shot by shot, these grandiose buildings have been reduced to ruins. My first stop was Baidoa, the former headquarters of the transitional government. Baidoa was once called the city of death because so many people starved here. Today it's an overgrown market town full of curious children who have seen very few foreigners during Somalia's years of isolation. The parliament meets in an old grain warehouse. In the 1990s, the United Nations used it as a base to feed people. Inside, eager parliamentarians were holding their first session since grabbing control of the country. The government says it is still under attack, and it seems to be. Insurgents are regrouping, and every night there are heavy strikes. Now the Islamists are defeated in the, in the, in the battlefield, but still they are, they have people here, they have in the country, and they have many supporters. So they do. They still they, do. They, they, they have. They have uh, in the public. Terrorist tactics have already been used in Somalia. Just outside of Parliament, I passed a blackened shell of a car. It's the untouched remains of a suicide bomb that missed Somalia's president by a few feet this past fall. The blast killed his younger brother and seven bodyguards. No one has cleared the remains. In Somalia, there is too much else to do. After a day in Baidoa, I hitched an hour-long flight with the Ethiopian Air Force to Kismayo, a seaside city that was one of the last Islamist strongholds. While the Ethiopians went off to hunt down the last remnants of the Islamist fighters hiding in the bush, I toured the town. Most people told me how relieved they were that the Islamists had left. During their rule, the Islamists tried to institute a 7th century version of Islam. Women were forbidden from working in the market or from mixing with men in public. Even more controversial, cigarettes were banned. I saw a sign outside a police station showing the things the Islamists tried to take away, like guns, walking sticks, grenade, and cot, a bushy green plant. Cot is a big hit across Somalia, sold by women at the markets and chewed everywhere by men as a mild stimulant. <laughs> Kismayo is one of the only places where the locals rioted against Islamist rule. Part of the reason is that many people here belong to clans that were not big supporters of the Islamists. As soon as the Islamists left, Kismayo reverted to its old self. At the bustling marketplace, Kat has returned, and so have the women. But Kismayo is still a very broken down city. I walked through a Hindu graveyard that, like so much of the rest of the city, had been turned into a garbage dump. It was fascinating to see the relics of an Indian community that had sailed here on the monsoon trade winds a long time ago. Meanwhile, my guard was tapping a heavy marble crypt 
saying it would be a good place to hide if someone starts shooting. Kismaya was ringed by fields of plastic tents, housing tens of thousands of displaced people. They are the victims of Somalia's many ills. Some were escaping clan fighting in 1991 and have been living beneath plastic ever since. Others ran from floods that washed away their farms and their houses. Many people said they came to the city simply because they were hungry, victims of Somalia's famines that never seemed to end. But there was very little help when they arrived. There are few jobs and no welfare. Most foreign aid organizations have pulled out of Somalia because it is so dangerous. The displaced people survive on handouts, a few bananas here, a cup full of rice there. Kismayo's rundown hospital isn't much better. This patient is one of the countless civilians cut down by indiscriminate gunfire. Without doctors, medicine, or even electricity, there's little the hospital can do. Malaria can be just as deadly. We saw a soldier who had contracted the disease in the low-lying swamps where there has been such heavy fighting. We left Kismayo one morning at dawn to get to Mogadishu. With us were a squad of 18 government soldiers assigned to protect us across a 300-mile stretch of road notorious for bandits and ambushes. It took a hellish 25 hours of driving to get to the capital. The road was so rutted and rocky that both of the trucks we used kept breaking down. We were glazed with dirt and sweat and hollowed out by hunger by the time we arrived. Mogadishu was once among the grandest cities in Africa, full of graceful buildings, breezy resorts, and Romanesque architecture. Now it is gutted to the core. The streets are patrolled by Somalia's notorious technicals, pickup trucks with anti-aircraft guns mounted on the back. I took a ride with some of the soldiers. At first they seemed tough, with their big guns and coils of ammunition. Sit down here. But I soon learned they were just kids, like any others. Many dream of the chance to go to school. They are part of a lost generation of young Somali men who have never sat in a classroom or held a book in their hands. I remember watching a few of them playing around, spitting watermelon seeds at each other, and wrestling over a cell phone. At times, it was nearly impossible to tell who is who. Some militias joined the government like those in green uniforms. Others wear street clothes. They all seem to know each other, though. In the presidential palace, trying to bring all these disparate groups together is Abdi Razak Adam Hassan. He lived many years in Canada and recently came home to help rebuild his country. I think the problem right now that that's consuming most of the uh, activities of the government here, 80% I would say of the activities, is the security. Um, reclaiming the, the, the country from, it, from its lawless past. I also met with clan elders who welcomed me in and helped me understand Somalia's very complicated clan tree. Much of the fighting here is clan based. Ever since the days of roaming the deserts, Somalis have been split among a dizzying number of clans. Each has its own army. Disarming them is priority number one for the new government. People are afraid to turn their weapons readily because uh, they wouldn't know whether the next person will also turn his or her uh, weapons at the same time. And they wouldn't know whether it's going to be thorough all across Somalia. Somalis clearly have their work cut out for them, but they have not given up. One final night, I crashed an upper-class wedding at my hotel. At first, the bride and groom appeared as somber as much of this country. But after the ceremony, the vibe picked up a bit. Women without veils and guys in t-shirts jumped onto the dance floor for the first time since the Islamists left. In the bubble of our hotel, it seemed like things were finally beginning to resemble normal. I went to bed that night feeling a bit hopeful. But while lying under my mosquito net and trying to fall asleep, I was reminded yet again of Somalia's uncertain future.